Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, I'm going to try to fulfill one of my New Year's goals of getting a bit more organized by going through these three boxes of mystery PC retro computer parts. These boxes, along with several others, have been sitting in my office upstairs, taking up space on the floor. So I really want to start going through them, figuring out what's in here, figuring out what works, what doesn't work, and then just trying to sort and get organized. So if you like this kind of thing, this video is probably for you. And if you don't, you might want to skip and check out one of my other older videos. So without further ado, let's get right to it. As I mentioned in the intro, it's one of my resolutions to try to get more organized here in the basement. And my office upstairs is an extension of that. I have lots of projects that are happening and stuff I want to make videos about, but I try to keep that stuff down here and I don't want it to spill over into the rest of my house because I like to use the rest of my house for its intended purpose, living in. Well, unfortunately with these boxes, a friend of mine was cleaning out his storage unit where he had tons and tons of old retro stuff and instead of just like tossing it out or giving it away to someone who doesn't appreciate it, he thought that I would appreciate this stuff more. So he offered it to me. And of course I said yes, because who doesn't want to look through boxes of cool treasure? But of course that creates the problem of now I have these boxes of parts that I need to try to sort through. For a little while they were in my living room, then they got moved into my office. And now they're down here, at least these three, so I can start to go through them but there's probably five or six more of these boxes this size just absolutely filled with stuff to go through so this will inevitably be a multi-part video i don't know how how far we're going to get into these boxes i'd like to explore the contents and then start testing the stuff that's in here as well because if the things are broken then i'll put them in the broken pile for potentially future repairs or maybe this stuff is like too far gone for even repairing who knows right we have to figure all that stuff out while watching this, if we have cards or things in here that seem to be kind of unknown and you're able to uncover some additional information about it, then definitely please send me an email. I'm going to show on screen right now how to find my email address. It's on my YouTube page. And then perhaps if we can cobble together the right information, like pictures of these cards and dumps of the ROMs, for instance, then maybe that can go on archive.org to help other people. So I think there's no time like the present to... Well, just pick one of these boxes and start looking through them. I'm going to be using the 70s towel. It's a little change of pace compared to the normal beige thing that you're looking at from the top down camera. And let's just grab the first thing out of one of these boxes randomly. It was the one that doesn't have a top on it. And it's this. Well, what we have here is an ISA 16 bit RAM expansion card. We have eight SIM slots and I am 99.9% .9 sure this will only accommodate one megabyte SIMs for a total of eight megabytes of RAM expansion. This is going to be one of the later expansion cards from Intel. The earlier cards from Intel used DIP ICs and to accommodate eight megabytes of DIP memory, it would have had tons and tons of chips on it and be really, really long. This one on the other hand, obviously is very compact. Now we do have these horrible plastic SIM sockets, but they don't appear to be broken. One slight worry is we have a missing DIP IC here that may or may not be required. And we have date code of 1992 ninth week on the main IC right here. Luckily, Intel stuff is relatively well documented. Oh, and on the back, <laughs> there's a Goodwill sticker, which is a thrift store here in the US, a little hard to read, but it says 99 cents. So someone found this in a pile of random stuff at Goodwill. These are the old stickers. They don't look like that anymore in here in uh, the Portland area. In case you're looking to build up an old PC, I would only ever use a card like this in something like an IBM PC AT that is eight megahertz or slower. And the reason why is any RAM you install on this card is limited to the speed of the ISA bus. And if you put it into a computer that say runs at 33 megahertz, well, this RAM here, this eight megabytes is gonna be stuck at the slow eight megahertz bus speed. And therefore you have bad performance anytime you use this memory. So therefore, yeah, really only use these in like IBM PC 5170s and similar machines to that. Now with a card like this, the problem is you definitely need to configure this. And earlier ones had a bunch of dip switches on it that allow you to set the start and end memory of the card. This one will be software configured, but I wonder if that software actually exists for it. Most or all of the Intel RAM expansion cards they made were called the Intel Above Board. 
and the drivers for the older ones or you know the dip switch settings are available but i am unfortunately not finding anything on this particular cart so i think what i'm going to start doing is i'm going to start marking these up so i know which ones i've looked at and which i have and i put a question mark on this one so that i know that we've looked at it on camera but i don't uh, initially have any information on this card so we have to do a little bit of sleuthing Moving on to the next card here. This is an interesting card. This appears to be a disc controller. Get the camera zoomed in just right. It's a disc controller that has cache memory on it. And by disc controller, I mean hard disk controller specifically. And this actually is hard drive and a floppy drive controller. And then we have two hard drive connections right there. The data transfers over these cables. On the ICs here, 1990s, the date code WD60C40. And take a look at this. It says hard cache slash SD, ESDI. It's an enhanced version of the MFM interface. I don't actually know the, the total detail or the differences between the two. Like if it's a signaling difference or their command differences. But we can see here that this thing actually has, wait, what is this? Do we have some kind of a processor here? We have an 8188. So yes, this thing runs 8088 code or 8086 code. This is the 186, so that's the embedded version of this. And we have an extra ROM chip right here. Over on the memory end of the card, it says CompuAd Incorporated, copyright 1989, all rates reserved. Looks like we have a connection for the hard drive LED. And then these are one megabyte SIMs. So we have four megabytes of RAM used for hard drive caching to really speed things up when this thing is accessing those SD hard drives. And then on the back side of the card, we also have some additional information there. Let's do a quick Google to see if we can find anything on this card. I don't have an SD drive, so there's really no way for me to even test this thing. All right, so we got some hits right off the bat. We have, looks like some drivers for this thing. So there it is. Yep, click to download, that's cool. Appears to be some jumper configurations and there's the card. And here's one that looks like it was for sale on eBay. And maybe those are other CompuAd cards. And for myself, really, to refresh my own memory, this is the Enhanced Small Disk Interface. It's an obsolete disk interface designed by Maxter as a follow-on to the ST506. So yeah, that is MFM-style hard drives. It's an improvement by moving certain parts that were kept on the controller, such as the data separator, into the drives themselves and generalizing the control bus so that more kinds of devices, such as removable disks and tape drives, could be connected. I've never actually had an ESD hard drive, and maybe back in the day I used one when I worked at a computer store, but I recall going from MFM directly to IDE on the PC side of things. And then, of course, SCSI was popular on Amigas and, App, uh, and Macintoshes and things like that. So ESDI could handle transfer speeds of up to 20 megabits per second, as opposed to 7.5 for ST506. And this is funny, high-end SCSI drives of the era were actually high-end SD drives with SCSI bridges integrated onto the drive. That's fascinating. Anyhow, this one is going to have to get the question mark. I'm just going to put it right here on this IC. And don't worry, by the way, I can um, use IPA to get these uh, Sharpie marks off these chips. And unfortunately, without an ESDI hard drive, there's really no way to test this. That's too bad. Okay, next up, we're not done with ISA cards in that box. Okay, so this is a regular Intel above boards. This is the earlier version of the one that takes SIMs. And I'm wondering actually, is this just the same chip? So maybe the same exact software works for both? Yes, it actually is. L1A4729, same exact thing. That's really good to know. That means that the software for this above board, which I think should be readily available, should work on this card. This is just like a shrunk down version where they took some of this TTL logic and probably, well, it might be those same exact chips. And does this, oh look, this has got that chip that's missing as well. So what's the deal with that? Good thing is the documentation for this old card should be around. And that means that <laughs> this should work. And I'm wondering if this classic here means it's just like this board here like shrunk down into this one yeah as i mentioned um this thing here can take i think eight megs of ram but i see it has these expansion headers i think you need a daughter board to do that so i'm quite sure on this board that these are 256k chips by one and we have nine of them because you have a parity chip so this board is configured right here with only two megabytes of ram plus parity and you would need some kind of a daughter board that plugs into these headers i think that would give you all that additional memory up to potentially eight megabytes. You could put multiple ones of these in your computers at one time 
and you use the software to configure the start and end addresses in them. And there's some kind of like non-volatile RAM that stores those configs. The earlier versions of these cards had jumpers and maybe the ones for the XTs. And you can notice that this one actually has a bunch of footprints here for serial and parallel expansion as well. So that was an optional thing you could get. I think that's completely separate from the RAM expansion. And obviously that's not implemented on the other one. Now, one thing that's a little bit concerning is this is a delay line right here. And you notice how it looks like it's bulging a little bit. I don't know if that's like failing. Yeah, it doesn't really push down. It's pretty hard. So maybe that's okay. But that has to do with some of the like RAS and CAS lines, I think, with the RAM. And if that goes bad, then that would need to be replaced before this board could work. Pretty sure this is the above board slash AT. And right here on minus zero degrees, we have shortcuts to installing the above board AT for DOS. It takes 64K or 256K, 150 nanoseconds or faster. Ah, okay, so this is not an above board AT because it says it has switch blocks on it. And obviously this one does not, nor does that other one. Here's a post that seems to talk about the fact that there's something called an above board plus. This is where it uses the EEPROM for setting up the card. Here's some photographs that has all those extra ports on it or the chips for those ports. And unfortunately, like other people are like, oh, you just set the dip switches and the, the original poster's like, no, nope, there are no dip switches in here. Looks like someone here has actually scanned the documentation. So I'm just gonna grab that. Oh no, this always happens. And the funny thing is, whenever I find on a forum post documentation or drivers that someone scanned or did whatever, I always download them when I need, you know, the, if it's for something I'm looking for, I download it and I save it locally. Well, save it to cloud storage because I cannot tell you how many times I see a driver somewhere. I hadn't saved it. I downloaded it, used it or whatever. And then say a year later, I wanted to go grab it. And then the link was dead just like this. So this was from 2021 and that, <laughs> that link is already dead. So there was also another post that says that they actually have a really good comprehensive collection here on minus zero degrees. Oh, look, and you know what? I should have just gone here in the first place. Above board plus installation guide. Let's just check that. That's probably exactly what we need. It's still slowly loading the PDF, but I also downloaded the software here. This is for the plus and awesome. Okay, so we have the files. Oh, right. So this is different. Oh, set board. That's what we needed for configuring the EEPROM. Okay, awesome. So I'm just gonna save this so we can test this in a moment when we get to that. That is. Good old minus zero degrees coming through once again, archiving this, because look at this. This is all archived off of the forums there that we were looking at. And so when those links go dead, minus zero degrees often has the stuff archived. That's awesome. Unfortunately, the PDF doesn't seem to work, but that's okay because I don't really need the installation instructions. There are no dip switches to configure. All we need to do is just run the software. So on this card here, I know it's hard to read, but I wrote above plus right there just to kind of remind me that it's a plus and I'm gonna do the same on here um, above. Uh, you know what, maybe I shouldn't be doing this until we've already tested the software, but I'm quite sure that this is exactly what this stuff is. Okay, moving on to the next card in the box here. This is, I think I, I, think I looked at this briefly, um, Media Byte here. I'm pretty sure this is gonna be some kind of a weird data acquisition card. So we have analog devices chips here, and obviously we have multiple channels for data acquisition, and it's an ADD AC, looks like 80N. We have an 8255. Yeah, we have a 24 channel peripheral interface chip. So this is really good for communicating with stuff like these chips. These will probably be eight bits wide. And uh, this has plenty of channels for that and probably uses some kind of like multiplexing thing so it can address just like one of these at a time. We obviously have dip switches here that configure stuff. And actually now that I look at this board a little closer, we have channel zero, channel one through channel five here, plus some dip switches that almost certainly sets the base IO for talking to that chip. And then this chip is what talks to all of the data acquisition hardware. And on the back here, hopefully that's in focus, we have, what is this, a 34 pin connector, uh, same as the floppy drive interface. And now we have some writing here, MBC 1984. And on the rest of this, not much to report. And we can take a look at what this analog to digital converter is, see how fast it is and the bit depth. Oh, look at that, 12 bit DA converter, kind of fancy. And in fact, I was calling this an analog to digital converter. It's a digital to analog converter. So in comes the bits here up to 12 bits, and then out comes a really good analog signal. I guess these V out right here. So we also have a sticker here. Let's try to look up 
these part numbers. It says uh, Metrobyte Corporation Revision 8939, and there's a serial number, 17,000. Also, there's a sticker on the edge of the box here. I know you can't read it, but it says board DDA-06, six channel, D slash A and D G I O. Oh, look, and it looks like this is owned uh, or the company is owned by Tektronix now. So that makes a lot of sense. Tektronix space right here in Portland. So it's pretty typical that you end up with Tektronix gear. Oh, actually, uh, this is a Keithley uh, product originally. Well, it was this Metrobyte and then Keithley must have bought them. And then I guess Tektronix bought Keithley. I'm not super familiar with like who bought who <laughs> throughout the years. Well, here are the features for this card. 24 bits of parallel digital I.O., six channels of 12-bit analog output. You can have up to 10 volts peak-to-peak -peak analog output range. It's good for servo controls and programmable voltage sources and programmable current sinks and a function generator. Kind of fascinating is that 8255 is, is strictly used for digital I.O., and the those DA chips look like they talk directly on the ISA bus, so there must be some address decoding. Yeah, right here that goes to those chips and then latches to hold the data, and oh, okay, that's kind of interesting. You know what's funny here, looking at this, I think I've actually shown one of these on the channel before. I must have had multiple of them, because I recall having a board like this that actually had this thing plugged into it on the expansion connector here with a bunch of screw terminals. So I guess the question is, with a card like this, besides being good for spare parts, uh, maybe I need one of these chips one day, so I kind of have it in my junk bin. What else is there to do with a card like this? Could someone write some software for it to do stuff? I guess the thing is, I don't I don't think I have the thing that plugs in here. And without that, I can't really do much with this. So that means, unfortunately, this is probably just going to go into my junk bin, which is like old cards and motherboards or whatever, things that are dead. And if I ever need to steal like a chip or something off here, there's a perfectly good chip and I could just quickly desolder it and steal it. So yeah, kind of unfortunate, but... Unfortunately, that's the reality of cards like this. Okay, so looking down in the box, I think that might be it for um, PC cards and stuff, at least in this first box. Got a random box of discs here. I don't even know where these came from, so let's just quickly gander at these. There may be personal data on these, so I'm probably not going to image these necessarily. When looking at these discs here, this all just appears to be backups and uh, some financial stuff managing your money, it looks like. So I'm not going to be archiving these and uploading them anywhere. And I did just quickly take a look through these, and I don't really see anything like there's no utilities, DOS utilities and stuff like that. I think those types of things are what are extra interesting. There may be lost stuff that's worth archiving on discs like that. But on these, that doesn't appear to be the case. Next up is this box here. And I'm pretty sure what's in here is not an Apple IIe card. It's very full, whatever is in here. Includes the Apple IIe software. I wish this was a boxed version of one of these. Now I have a couple of these cards, but I don't have any of the original cables. I have one reproduction cable, but that is it. Okay, what is this? <laughs> what is this? This appears to be... Maybe something for the Commodore 64. All right, so this thing here, which has a couple regular 3.5 millimeter, looks like a nine pin, maybe that goes into the joystick. Connects onto the side there. Uh, does this actually take a battery? Yes, it does, nine volt battery there. I can see some kind of a serial number just sort of scratched in right there. This almost looks like the cassette interface port on the 64, but obviously this uh, can't be that, I don't think. We have a couple button, and obviously we have this label here, ESAM's key, P.O. Box 309, Yakuts, Oregon, 97498, maybe it looks like. Now, I don't actually know if this stuff even all goes together. We have just a normal 25-pin cable. That's boring. We have what looks like, uh, I'd say this plugs into the user port on the 64, and it's, oh, ESAM's cognitive learning system. Serial number 1001, ESAM Learning Systems Incorporated from Yakuts, Oregon. And this cartridge here, which we'll open this stuff up in a second. This has a RCA jack on it. And we have another cartridge, and this actually plugs into the cartridge connector. So we'll have to check this out. So, yep, same thing. Serial number is really low. wonder what the deal is with this. This thing here on the edge of the cartridge says ESAM's memory, November 1, 1987. And there it is, 1001-12. Nothing's written on the user port cartridge other than the label that we see. And it looks like someone's pried this open at some point. And I don't know if that was me. I don't think that was me because I don't really recall ever looking at this stuff. 
before. So we'll open that up in a second. Uh, we have another cartridge here for the 64 as well. Switch training, ESAM learning again. And um, that's all there is to say about that one. And the rest of what was in there, I'm pretty sure doesn't go with it. Uh, a short power cord, that's kind of useful. And two phone cords. So we can ignore those cables and we need to look at this stuff. So first off, let's open this. What exactly is in here? That doesn't fit. We'll use this smaller screwdriver. That doesn't fit either. Oh, it's a flathead. Wow. Now I really have to wonder, like, how does this thing connect up? If this is for the 64, this is all one set. Clearly this goes into the joystick port, one of the ports. But was there a cable that plugged into the cassette port and that's missing? Now, perhaps what this is, is like some kind of a learning system for special special education or special needs children. Something that uses the Commodore 64 and maybe there is an external um, keyboard or user interface device that allowed these children, special needs children, to uh, learn with this software. So there are the innards. Looks like we can actually remove this connector. Oh, wow, look at that. That's just a regular power supply connector for <laughs> hooking up disk drives and stuff. And an HC14N there, along with a couple little Motorola parts, maybe op amps or something, drivers, some relay control there, and um, well, whatever this is hooked up through a phone jack, which I didn't even notice. So that's kind of interesting. Let's see if I can get these cartridges apart. I think usually these, they, I don't see any screws or anything. So these are just sort of pressed together. So we have two 27256 EEPROMs in here. I'm gonna just get a marker and um, how do I label these? What I like to do is this, which kind of helps me orient them when I put them back in. I'll just number these as well. There's probably some cartridge aficionados for the 64 who will recognize the PCB layout here. It's probably just all pretty much run of the mill. And this cartridge here was made by Salakian Molding Company out of Fresno, California. And this particular cartridge, this was the switch training one. So we'll open up the other ones here. I assume we're gonna see the same thing. Ah, this looks different. So we have four EEPROMs in this one, the same thing, 27256s. And this one here is just the cognitive learning system. So of course we'll be testing these in a 64 and I'll be dumping these ROMs as well. So those are the two cartridges. And now we just have this user port device left and just make sure there's no screws and there are not. Okay, that is very homemade. Look at that. If we lift this out, <laughs> there's this folded up piece of plastic here. Trying to keep this uh, <laughs> from bouncing around too much. Oh, and look at the back of this thing, wire wrapped, very fancy. So I wouldn't be surprised if this is either like a digital analog or analog to digital converter here on the user port. Let's look up this chip here, SC-01-A. Well, I'll be, it is not a digital analog converter. This is a speech synthesis chip from Votrax Incorporated. And there it is. During the 1970s, Votrax produced a series of discrete speech synthesizers with epoxy coated boards to thwart people copying the designs. In 1980, they designed and manufactured an IC speech synthesizer called the SC-01, which is what we have here. This IC proved very popular to third-party market and was produced until at least 1984. Well, and I uh, beg to differ on that because I'm pretty sure if we look here, this is from 1987. Now I'm kind of curious when we hook this thing up uh, with these cartridges, is it going to start talking out of the Commodore 64? How cool would that be? I did a quick Google search for ESAM cognitive learning system and um, uh, nothing came up at all. So this is probably gonna be something that I'm gonna need people's help for to try to uncover like what the details are about this thing. But I think what we're gonna do right now is I'm just gonna set this stuff aside and we will test this stuff out in a moment once we just get through the, the rest of what's in this box because this video is already going on for quite, quite a long time. All right, let's just go quickly through the rest of this stuff so we can get to testing. Well, this is kind of cool, just some random stuff. So we have a compact flash to PCM CIA adapter. Uh, these are great because you could just take a, a CF card like this. This is 128 meg one. There we go. So that goes like that, it slots in, and this is no thicker than a normal PCM CIA card. And now you can plug this into a normal PC laptop, one of the older ones. And then what you get is disk ex expansion because these just are ID hard drives essentially. And I think plugged into here, 
This essentially just makes it look like a, an IDE hard drive to Windows. I don't know if it works in DOS or not, maybe with some specific drivers, but that is kind of cool to have. What else is in here? Well, we got some CPUs attached to chips. Okay, so that's just a cooler Pentium, it looks like. And this one as well. Uh, might be 486, might be Pentium, I'm not 100% sure. This one says CPU cool, 1.9 inches, made in the USA, PC power and cooling. I haven't heard of this brand, but I bet you there's people who are watching who probably have. And what we have on here is definitely a 46 of some kind. Can I get this off though? Unfortunately, I think that's epoxied on because that's not budging, not at all. And if we keep going, looks like we got an overdrive chip in here. That is freaking awesome. Oh, wow. Okay, so this is a Pentium overdrive. It's probably, I'm not actually sure which one this is. I think people watching will know better than me. This would go into a normal socket five, I think, which is the Pentium processor. So we'll have to look up what this is exactly. And maybe I'll just uh, write that on the bottom here just to help me understand what this chip is exactly. And if we just keep unwrapping, looks like we have a Pentium non-MMX 200 megahertz. And we have a 46DX33. So that's run of the mill. These are pretty common. In fact, these are some of the most common 46s that are out there. So with this 46 that I can't get off because it's glued on, sometimes you can look this number up here and we could try to identify what that is. Unfortunately, I came up with nothing. I'm just wondering if 33 means 33 megahertz. In fact, we have another one right here. Let's just compare. This one here, nope. I don't think that number means anything because uh, that one doesn't, doesn't really match at all. Now, this does not look like it's epoxy down. It looks like it's glued on. So I'm going to use my vise to try to, to extricate this a little bit. I don't like... I don't like it when the heatsink is attached to the chip. I'd rather them be two separate things. Well, I got it off, but in the process, I chipped the ceramic and uh, it was really unavoidable. That stuff was so glued on there. I heated this up and everything. And there it is. It's an Intel 46DX2 internal sample. So we have a 66 megahertz part here from 1989 and as you can see, the corner got chipped. Hopefully this part still works. I'm super bummed that that happened, but let's see if we can clean this up a little bit. First, I'm gonna start with this uh, acetone here. Oh, that's not doing anything. <laughs> or is it? Oh, it is. That is actually having an effect. So there it is, cleaned up. 46DX2 internal samples only. What a cool looking chip. And we'll, we'll test this to see if it works. So in case anyone is wondering or has markings like that on the bottom of their chip, there you go. You know that it's, uh, it's one of these here. <laughs> Next, let's focus on this Intel overdrive here for the Pentium. So normally you can just look up this part number on the bottom. Although in this case, that brings up absolutely zero hits on Google. So I'm over here on Wikipedia and we have a couple different versions. So there's a socket four version, which this definitely is socket five. So this is not that version. This is going to be well, I don't know what this is going to be. I, I assume it's going to be one of these. Overdrive for the Pentium 75, 90, and 100 were released. Socket 5, 3.3 volts, running at 125, 150, and 166 with a multiplier of 2.5. What's the point of that even? Because you could just, I mean, I've, I've never had a Pentium motherboard at socket 5 where you couldn't just take one of those chips and put it in there. The only thing I'm thinking of is like really old systems that were early days that didn't support the higher multipliers on those later chips. It does say here that the 125 megahertz one is an oddity because Intel never made a Pentium 125 as a standalone processor. So that's kind of interesting. Oh, okay, this is reminding me here that we actually have the speed printed in the corner of this. All right, so there it is, 150 megahertz for socket five. So nothing really that weird. If this were the 125, that'd be kind of cool, but 150 is kind of boring. All right, moving on, we have, looks like a cache module for socket five motherboard, socket seven, socket five motherboards. Earlier ones had these called Coast Cache on a Stick. So I don't know if there's like a standard. I'm sure I have a motherboard that uses this around somewhere, but I don't have one handy, so we can't easily test that. Okay, well, let's move this stuff away. Let's put these processors in a safe place, even though I already kind of messed up the Intel internal sample one. There's a box here that says Rebel on it. I don't know what's in here. Oh, mice. Okay. <laughs> so we got, this looks like a mouse for the AT&T Unix system. And it looks 
basically brand new, or no, PC7300. Yeah, the PC7300 is absolutely the Unix PC. So <laughs> a brand new mouse for the Unix PC. Now I have a Unix PC, it's under the crawl space and there will be future videos on it at some point. Yeah, I just, I'm not ready to quite do that yet. I really have to kind of dig into those, but um, I'm pretty sure it has a mouse, but now I have a spare, that's cool. And then we have a Sun Microsystems mouse, which is actually good because I have a little Sun computer that I wanna uh, do a video on. So now I have a keyboard and a mouse for that Sun. So that's perfect. Looks like we have one of these hilarious CD, like shareware compilations, the 40 best Windows 95 games for Windows 95 and play dozens of the best games on Windows 95. And looks like it comes with 10 free hours of CompuServe. Uh, looking at the back of this, you can get an idea of what's included here. So uh, 3D Maze and a bunch of stuff here. Pitfall, Solitaire 95, Match 32. Who knows, but yes, shareware. Top quality software before you pay the author. Requires 386 SX or higher. 46 is recommended. Windows 95 NT or Win32 S, whatever that means. Eight megabytes of RAM, SVGA. This thing seems to come from 1996 TLC Properties Incorporated. And we have a couple screenshots. I mean, Hangman is definitely the best game ever for Windows 95. <laughs> I mean, seriously, none of these are the best games ever. And that's what this thing is promising on the front here. So I guess I have a question. I, I can obviously, I'll make a, an ISO of this and upload to archive.org. But the question is, would someone like to see me um, do a dedicated episode where I put this in my Windows 95 computer and we, we try out some of these games? So there's the CompuServe thing. Let's... Uh, Let's get this thing out of here. <laughs> 40 best games. Give me a break. Insert it into your CD-ROM from the Windows Program Manager. Select Run. Program Manager, huh? That sounds like Windows 3.1 to me. So they put a ton of effort into this thing. I am sure all of the games that are on here are 32-bit only and only work on Windows 95. Nothing on here is Windows 3.1. What a scam. <laughs> All right, well, yeah, so let me know what you think about this and I will upload this to archive.org and there will be a link in the description. So if you want to play around with this, you can do so to your heart's content. But we're not done with that box. I just moved it out of the way. There's got more stuff in here. <laughs> okay, so looks like we have an original Apple Talk interface. Oh, and it's one of the ones that's for the older Mac, the 128 and the 512. That is awesome. I'm not sure I have any Apple Talk cables though. And I have a bunch of phone net stuff. So it's the same as this, but it uses phone wires and it was a much more in less expensive way to do it because those phone wires work just as well. And Apple was selling you these very expensive proprietary long cables. So you could do this networking between all the early Macintoshes. And this is one of those interfaces. So I don't know, I think I'm, I have like one or two of these. So that's pretty cool. I wanna do an episode on Apple Talk stuff one day, and these will make it possible. Microsoft bus mouse, yep, no PS2. All right, so that's cool. I like this Dove bar. No, this is not the Dove bar style. This is the later one. The Dove bar is not curved. This is supposed to be ergonomic, only for right-handed people though. If you're left-handed, screw you. You can't use this mouse. It says on the bottom here, serial mouse port compatible mouse 2.0. So with the right adapter, this works with a serial port as well, which maybe is in here. Nope. This is for a Macintosh. This goes from DIN 8 to 9-pin. So a little adapter. We have a super generic looking serial mouse. Oh, no, this is not that generic. It's actually from Logitech. Cool. You know, Logitech makes very fancy stuff. They were making mice like this, just cheap plastic stuff back in the day. And it is absolutely just a normal serial mouse, as you can see there. And lastly, we have another serial mouse <laughs> from Star Industries. You can tell this thing is of extreme high quality. Just check that out. <laughs> What's going on? What is this? It's like supposed to be like from Mexico with a sombrero and... I mean, I don't know, is that a cable or bullets or what is that? I don't know what's going on there. That's just really hard to understand. 
You can just tell, if we just move this out of the way, the extreme quality of this thing. Uh, therefore, no, it feels terrible. I mean, the buttons click, so there's that. Made by Logitech. You gotta be kidding me. Model number 2F-ST. I mean, this is definitely a serial mouse, right? Yeah, this is definitely serial mouse, right? Could this possibly be for the Atari? No, I don't think so. Made in Taiwan. It's a ball mouse. Warranty void if you uh, take that off. And wow, what a freaking, what a junky mouse. Logitech, how disappointing. Look at this thing. Anyways. Okay, and the last thing that was in the box was this, which is a lead former. What you're doing is if you're building PCBs up, you put your part in there, say a resistor or a diode, and you match the pin spacing of whatever's on your PCB, and then you just bend those pins down super easily. No fuss, no muss. And that's pretty sweet. These are very handy, to be honest. If you're building kits, these rock. Okay, we're getting to the near the end of what's in the box, and then we'll do some testing here. So we have a RCA Electronic Instruments, the WG297 High Voltage Probe. Oh, there's a picture of it right there. So what this is, is exactly that. It's a very high voltage probe. So at the end of this, we have a few different things to connect. So these would say go into your multimeter. This is ground. And then you can stick this into what you're measuring. And because you have all this insulation here and these rings here to prevent uh, any kind of voltage from like leaking along the outside and making its way to your hand where you're holding it, this is probably rated for some pretty high voltages. Now, according to this little sheet here, resistor type number, so you would set your multimeter to 500 volts and I guess you multiply it by 100, whatever the reading is. Problem is the resistance is 1090 mega ohm. I don't really know too much about these. So if you're watching and you happen to know how these work, I'm just not sure if you need to have some kind of extra resistor or you need to use this on a specific kind of multimeter. Non-electronic 20,000 ohm per volt meters require a separate multiplier resistor. For example, on a 5,000 volt range, the 20,000 ohm per volt meter has an input resistance of 100 mega ohm. The WG210 has a resistance of 900 mega ohms. Yeah, it seems to be this seems to be talking about you need to add some kind of resistor while you're using it with certain meters. What I don't know is if we plug this into a modern meter, something that's digital, what exactly happens and is that resistor already in this mess of wires here? So I don't really know. Now, luckily I have some high voltage probes that I use for measuring CRTs. That's all I ever really need to use those for. I, I don't know how or when I would use this and I'm not even sure how to use this in any kind of accurate way. So definitely looking for help if you happen to know, because that would be, that'd be handy. It says it extends the DC range of your, your multimeter up to 50,000 volts. Can you imagine measuring 50,000 volts with this, especially if it's high current? That'd be really scary. But I guess I do that with TV sets and I use my high voltage probe, which has a similar construction to this, and I can measure those. So, and those are 25,000 volts or whatever. Anyhow, yeah, pretty cool, but I need help understanding how to use this. Second to last thing in the box is a realistic high power tape eraser. Awesome. Now I have one of these. Mine's a little kind of beat up and janky. This one, which looks to be basically the same as the one I have, but in really, really good shape and in the original box. So yes, this is exactly what you think it is. It's a degausser. There's an instruction pamphlet in here. So you plug this into the wall and you hold this like so, and there's a trigger right there and you hold your tape, whether it's a audio tape, video tape, whatever, magnetic or disc even, and you push the button and you wave this around like that. And it will induce through the coils that are in here, through the AC mains, 60 Hertz, magnetic field that alternates back and forth, and that will have the effect of erasing your media. And absolutely, this does work, and I've used this before. And it, you know, when you erase something, if you just do it like quickly, it doesn't really do a great job. You kind of have to really go around it and you know do this whole kind of thing. Probably we'll talk about that in the instructions. The benefits of the eraser, it reduces the background tape noise to virgin levels, eliminates computer program blowing glitches on magnetic disks, program blowing. <laughs> Okay, 
Improves video recording quality by eliminating all previously recorded signals. I mean, I don't know about any of that stuff. Generally, the erase heads that are on, you know, not crap cassette decks or VCRs, they will erase the media entirely. But this will give you like that virgin tape so that you don't ever have little bits of the old recording behind and will erase metal audio tape. On the back side, the eraser is designed for intermittent use only. One minute on and 30 minutes off. Do not violate this procedure. It is normal for the unit to become warm while in use. So after one minute of squeezing the trigger, the red light is on. You must let it cool for 30 minutes. And then how to use it. It says make sure your tape is rewound onto one of the reels. Hold the eraser in your hand and squeeze the trigger. Red light indicates the unit is operating. While squeezing, place the bottom of the eraser in contact with the item to be erased and move the eraser slowly in a circular motion over the entire area, but do not release the trigger yet. Make the circular pass around the tape for approximately 10 to 20 seconds, then slowly withdraw the eraser unit until it's about three feet away from the tape and then you can release the trigger. It's very similar to degaussing um, a CRT monitor. You have to kind of do this wavy thing and then move further and further away and that reduces the field until it's, well, three feet away. You don't really get the field anymore. And now you turn the cassette or just get over and repeat, uh, repeat steps three and four. So because the tape, if you're using videotape, it's like whatever, one inch thick, you only kind of get like half the tape. So you flip it around, do that same process again. And then at that point, you have run this thing for a minute and it's a, uh, can't use it again. And it does say here that most tapes will require 10 to 20 seconds, but some tapes require a longer run. Metal tapes require a minimum of 20 seconds per side and do not use the eraser longer than a minute at a time. Yeah. So how cool is that? I think these were pretty common back in the day at Radio Shack. You could just pick these up. They weren't super expensive. So they are floating around. So if you are looking for one of these, you can get them off eBay, which is exactly where I got my first one. And they're not generally that expensive, although who knows these days, I haven't looked in a long time. So there we have it, the high power video audio tape eraser. There's the cat number if you wanna try to look for one of these on Ebays. I think other companies made these, but this is the Radio Shack one and uh, it works very well. Okay, and the last thing that we have in the box is this piece of test equipment here. So it says that this is a transistor curve tracer, model A by Judd Williams. I don't really know much about this. I've seen curve tracers before made by Tektronix, but those things have like a display on them, like a CRT that show you these curves. And I think these are for testing the breakdown voltage of transistors, something like that. You set your base current, so microamps per step, and that is like that, open base, zero FET. We have a selector here for right, left, or probe. Uh, do we have the probe? We do have the probe. Here's the probe, plugs into a DIN connector, and it's got some pins on it. Cool, and we have a voltage setting and then we have an on and off switch. How does this thing work? I don't know. On the back, we have the mains input and this, whatever that is. Now this has no display. Oh wait, look at the top here. So, oh, oh, all right, cool. So these are actual connectors. You can just plug the transistor in and we have a bias control. And I assume, I don't know why you have two. Uh, this one actually has a transistor stuck in there. Part was actually installed. Now the question is, this doesn't really have any display. So how do we, how do we get a reading? I wonder if this connects to your multimeter. That's what I almost think would happen. There are three leads there and maybe you put your transistor here and you keep turning this up and then you can read the multimeter display. I looked up Curve Tracer and Judd Williams, which is what's written on here in this thread here. Yet another Judd Williams Curve Tracer. And there's one listed here on eBay, it looks to be identical to this. One difference is that little uh, wiring harness on the back has a BNC and also looks like a connector that would plug into your banana jacks. I don't know what that means. And we have a thread on EV blog as well, where people are talking about this particular unit. It mentions here, there's a copy of the manual on uh, this website here. And there it is right there. So that's excellent because I have no idea how this thing might work. Oh, cool. It shows it connected up to some type of a oscilloscope looking device. I wonder if it's like XY mode and then that'll do the curve tracing. And indeed, look at that. The oscilloscope is operating in XY mode with the curve tracer and then it will display the pattern. Do I have any knowledge of how this thing might work? No, not at all, but at least uh, I can, I guess, play around and see if I can get this thing working. I think I'm gonna leave this testing for another video 
because this is getting very long. And if I keep testing everything here, well, we'll never get to the end of this video. I did just save the manual for this just in case this website goes away. It would be nice to have the schematics though, because this thing is obviously a very old piece of equipment. And if it doesn't work, well, maybe I could fix it, possibly. What I don't really understand is what a curve tracer is good for. I've never had one, I've never needed to use one. So I don't really understand why you would use one. I do know that people who have them really do appreciate them and get good use out of them, especially for figuring out if you have a fake transistor, say you order a rebadge from China, these things can help you figure out if the transistor is fake or not. So I'd love to know more about that. So if you have any pointers, comment down below, please. So that is everything that was in this first box here. I was optimistic I'd get to all three, but that's definitely not happening. I could tell by how my voice feels that I've been talking a lot. So therefore this video is pretty long. So with all that said, let me clear off the bench here and let's do some testing. I have my 46 test bench out so we can test out those 246 processors. And why don't we try out this ESDI card? I don't have a hard drive, but at least we could see if it does work. I've gone ahead and already dumped these ROMs and they both read properly. I have an ISA VGA card installed along with my XT IDE. Let's pop this ESDI card in here. I've gone ahead and I verified that the jumpers are all configured correctly and they are. I just expect to see, I don't know, like some kind of a, a message or something that pops up when you turn on the computer. Okay, we're seeing absolutely nothing at all. I'm just getting the XT IDE BIOS and it's at D800. And the way the jumpers are configured on the SD card, it is configured for C800. And let's try the ROM dump program just to see if it even sees a ROM at C800. It does see a ROM there. Okay, yeah, it's showing up, CompuAd but why doesn't it show anything at the BIOS screen? Perhaps with this ESDI controller, you go into the BIOS and you set up your hard drive heads and cylinders just like you would with MFM, and maybe the BIOS that's on the card just hooks the BIOS's hard drive routines to speed them up by using the cache memory on this card. I guess it's good to know that this card at least is kind of doing something. I mean, there's really no way to test this or really use this card because as I mentioned, I have no ESDI hard drives. For now, I'm gonna put, I guess, a tick mark and a question mark just to say that it seems to work but i don't really know all right next thing for testing we have two cpus to try out the original dx33 in my right hand and the one that i chipped the dx266 in my left now the one that's in here now is actually just a standard dx266 so putting either of these in should just work i didn't look for bent pins but obviously this one has some because it doesn't drop in let's try the chipped one in here let's see if this works that just goes into the socket because you really should have some kind of a heat sink on these types of chips. I'll just place that one there. And let's turn this on and see what happens. So yeah, DX266 at 66 megahertz. So even with that chip in the corner, this thing freaking works. That's awesome. Now I did a little research and it looks like the DX266 came out officially in 1992. And the date code that's on this one or the date that's on this one is 1989. I'm not really sure if that's just Intel's 46 copyright date that they put on all the chips. So I don't really know when exactly this chip is from, but we can run the check CPU program here and it just says it's a classic 46 at 67 megahertz. Let's pop this heatsink off, see how warm the chip is. And it's really warm in the middle where the die is. It's, it's less warm <laughs> in the corners. That is pretty awesome that this thing survived my butchering. It looks pretty bad right there. Is that, I don't know what's really showing through there, but that actually didn't cause any real damage. Here's a 33 megahertz part and the pins are in really good shape, except for a couple right there. There are lots of different ways to try to straighten CPU pins. I personally use something like this little spudger thing here and I just very carefully bend pins back into shape. And you just look at them at the different angles, just keep looking through the pins until you see absolutely nothing that looks like it's bent. And now those pins are straightened and yep, that processor pops in there's almost a 100% chance that this chip is gonna work. These are just such reliable ICs. I'll power the computer up. Gotta eat a gummy bear. My blood sugar is a bit low according to my insulin pump. There it is, 46DX at 33 megahertz. According to Check CPU, it's just a classic 46 at 33.6 megahertz. All looks good. I'll put a tick mark on the bottom of both of these chips just so I can identify in the future that they work, especially the one here with the chip on it. Now on this sample chip, I think I'm gonna put the tick mark on the top because it would be very easy to remove with IPA and I'd be afraid of 
possibly erasing those numbers on the bottom if I try to clean up the Sharpie at some point in the future. Next up, we have the Pentium Test Bench. What I'm really interested in testing out is the Overdrive chip. I don't really care so much about this Pentium 200 chip. I'm sure this thing works. These are ultra reliable. I will need to remove my heatsink off of the chip that's on here, which looks like it's similar chip. I think this is an MF MMX chip, maybe a 166. And then we just match the notch on here to the notch on the socket. And there we go, that popped right in. Now this is a socket seven versus a socket five. I don't think that should matter. And I was thinking about what the point of this chip was. I kind of mentioned that earlier when I was looking at this chip. Why did they make this? All the Pentium chips, if I'm not mistaken, run at a 66 megahertz bus or you know something like 66 or lower. So that means that all the motherboards should support all the different types of chips. So what exactly was the point of this overdrive chip? I'm not really totally sure. Was it that early motherboards only supported really low multipliers and you needed something to force the issue? I, I don't know. If you know, put a comment down below. And I think we're ready for testing. Let's power this on. The fan is running. Okay, the system is posting. So it thinks it's a 166. That's weird. Maybe there's a jumper to configure for Pentium Overdrive. I'm not totally sure about that. Uh, I must have something configured in the BIOS for a secondary hard drive. We'll just skip over that. I seem to be having some trouble booting this thing. I don't think it's related to the CPU. I think this has to do with my compact flash card. I've tried a few different things in the BIOS, like large and LBA mode, and none of those seem to work. I guess we need to go back to the original CPU on this motherboard just to see if this is a problem with this overdrive somehow. Don't really see how. I'm just gonna place the cooler on there on top of the chip. There's enough heatsink compound just for at least booting this a little bit. All right, so 200 megahertz. So I guess it's uh, not a 166. If this thing freezes the same way, then yeah, I don't know what's going on with this motherboard. Something I did to it. Or maybe it failed, I don't know. Oh, it freaking works. Oh, very interesting. So that other chip is actually not working. All right, well, that is actually kind of fascinating. I'm assuming maybe there's a jumper or something I have to set. Perhaps it is being overclocked and this chip does not appreciate the overclock. Let's just try it one more time now that that actually booted at least once. Now with this type of motherboard, there are no settings in the BIOS when it comes to like setting up the CPU. There are some jumpers on here and I should probably look at them. Actually, look at this. There is a clock frequency for the CPU. It's set to 66. We have a few different choices to pick from. Why don't we just pick 50 just for fun? Okay, now we're running 125 megahertz. So that tells you the multiplier of this particular CPU is 2.5. Oh, look at this. It's actually working. So I guess it was somehow being overclocked and that was uh, making it very unhappy. So here's what we get from the CPU identification utilities. We get a P54 processor with a C0 stepping. And there is our explanation. So the clock multiplier is 2.5, but for the 150 megahertz part, which we have, we're supposed to run it with a 60 megahertz bus. I'm currently running it on a 50 megahertz bus, hence the 125 and the 166 megahertz part can run a 66 megahertz bus. So it was getting overclocked and that probably was a little bit too much for this particular chip. I guess there was just no headroom on it. And I can only make an assumption that all of these parts, the 166 through 125 are identical. It's just that Intel binned them, basically finding chips that could only run at 125 megahertz stable and then mark them as such, sold them like that. And the 166 parts were like the cream of the crop of this particular whatever generation of chip to give you that maximum speed. An interesting little tidbit about these different speed parts is that early on, like this was a binning thing. So they had parts they manufactured and they could only run at say 125 megahertz. So they labeled them as such. But later on the manufacturing process got better, but they had these artificially created speed buckets already. And it turns out that you could have a part that was labeled 125 and it was actually an identical part to the 166 and it would run perfectly at 166 as well but they just needed something to sell at that cheaper artificial lower speed that was originally created because of inferior production part like this one. But then later they had to just keep selling something. So they actually ended up selling much faster parts that were just badged to be slower. And that's one of the reasons why you can get a lot of overclocking headroom out of some of these chips with doing very little.
Anyhow, back to the chip here. What we have confirmed is that this 150 megahertz part does absolutely work, so it gets a tick mark on the bottom. And finally, we're gonna test these two RAM cards. I just wanna see if these ones work, especially this one here. For using my 3D6SX test bench, which is what we're gonna use for this, I'm gonna use this IDE card here that's been modified to have a right angle IDE connector so I can plug my compact flash in very easily. If I didn't change this connector to right angle, then the compact flash adapter would stick out this way and that's kind of annoying. And for booting this thing up, I like to use my XT IDE ROM, which is this little card here. People are certainly gonna ask about this. It's made by Monotech, and I think I had this PCB made at uh, one of the PCB manufacturers, but you can also buy this directly from Monotech. And you can see the construction is pretty simple. We have some switches, a jumper, a resistor pack, and then we have uh, the EEPROM here, and then there is an IC underneath there for address decoding. It can accept two different EEPROMs, but I haven't populated the other half. And I have an XT IDE BIOS here configured just to use the standard IDE interface that is on this. And it's great because motherboards like this have an older BIOS that do not support large cards like this four gigabyte card or whatever I have here. So I just have to plug that little card in plus this and that just bypasses the onboard BIOS and I don't have any of those restrictions that you normally have. And the benefit of using this over an 8-bit XT IDE card on a machine like this is obviously we're taking advantage of the 16-bit ISA bus to get better performance than I would get out of this 8-bit card. It's pretty significant. It's more than twice as fast with this combo. I currently have two megabytes of RAM on this motherboard and the ISA bus can only address up to 16 megabytes. So you don't wanna have too much on the motherboard and then try to add additional RAM through the 16-bit bus. I copied those above board utilities that we downloaded onto the compact flash card. And I think it's set board. I don't have the board in here, obviously, but set board, I think is how we configure this. Yes, yeah, so there we go. So it says this is for configuring above board 286s and the above board plus. Before running this program, you should install a card in your computer. So let's exit this and put the card in the computer. We'll start with this two megabyte one here, which is quite the behemoth of a card. There we go, it's installed. Okay, so we had a mismatch because this card is already configured to do something with the memory. And I wish there was a way to like stop it from doing that. Currently it's conflicting with some of the onboard memory and that's one of the problems with this. And you notice how it slows down right there to count up that extra memory. Now, hopefully this isn't gonna cause too much trouble. As long as you don't use the extended memory right now while this is conflicting, should be okay. So we'll run set board here now. So we're gonna continue. Uh, we don't have any of that stuff. I'm just sort of skipping through this. Okay, so we're on a 16-bit bus. It's looking for the card. Okay, it found a card. Interesting how it has some kind of a long model number string. All right, looks like it has a couple different set of methods. Now, this is obviously a 40 megahertz system. The bus is only running at eight megahertz. We'll do the manual setup. So first of all, we can view the contents. Don't know what any of that means. We'll start the setup here. So choose the IO address for your board. Who knows? We'll just pick the first one. Now this card has the ability to add additional conventional memory. This machine already has full 640K, so we don't really need to do that, but there are the choices. So we'll do no conventional. And then choose the appropriate extended memory start address. So this computer currently has two full megabytes of RAM. Now, one of the things that's a little confusing is some boards like 286 boards will say have one megabyte of memory on board and it supplies 640K for conventional memory. Then there's a hole of 384K that's for like the ROMs and stuff like that. And then there's another 384 of extended memory. So you would need to start adding memory with this card at the top of the memory that's on the motherboard. Now, it doesn't look like it has a way to start at 384K, which is not this motherboard, but that's one of my other 286 boards. This one has two full megabytes of RAM and the 640K is conventional memory. Then it has 384 of cache memory. So that first megabyte is used up in that first meg of RAM. And then that entire second megabyte is in the extended memory space. And that means that we're gonna start this card at two megabytes. Now it does say view for view current setting. Okay, so that's why it was acting weird is because this is currently configured to supply from one to 2.5. Does that mean that this thing actually has two and a half megs of RAM on it? Okay, well, anyways, it doesn't matter. We're gonna start it at two, and then now it's asking to choose the end address. Now, I think this card has two full megs of RAM on it, which means the end address should be four megabytes. And we're gonna say it's a 12 megahertz system because it's faster than that, but 
Let's see what happens. Uh, how fast is the RAM? Looks like everything on this board here is 100 nanoseconds, so we'll pick 120. And there we go. So this should give us a total now of four megs of RAM once this is all done. So we're gonna save. Now it's programming the card. And there we go. We're gonna do exit and we're gonna have to reboot obviously. And here we go. Uh, the problem is we're gonna have to, well, it already detected the memory size change. Let's power cycle the computer and keep note of how quickly it's counting the memory because once it starts checking the RAM on this, it's gonna slow way down. Here we go. Yep. There we go though. So the reason why it doesn't say like 4,096K is that because this particular motherboard does not check the memory that is used for that 384 of caching. That's between 640K and the one megabyte boundary. It's a 386 thing. It wouldn't be happening on a 286. So all we need to do is here, go into here and just save the settings and we'll hit escape. And now we'll boot up into DOS and we should have, well, I'll let this load high mem sys, which should check all the memory on this card, including that upper memory. It tested the card and if we type mem, we'll have three megs of extended memory, which, which is right. Because we have that 640K, we have that 384 cache. That's that first megabyte of RAM that's on the motherboard. Then the second megabyte of RAM on the motherboard plus the two on this card totals three and we have 3,072K of extended memory. So this card is working perfectly. Awesome. Now there's a check mem command. I thought it was a memory test, but it just seems to, I don't know, tell us how much RAM is on the system. I think older versions of DOS, you know, you didn't have this mem command. There's check COP, math coprocessor is present. Yeah, I do have the math coprocessor installed on here. And then there's test AB, what does that do? above board confidence test. Okay, so this is definitely a memory test of some kind. Let's hit Y. Oh, there's a lot of screens of text here. What kind of computer do we have? Well, we definitely have, closest we have is three. Do you have the piggyback memory attached to the board? Okay, so that's what I was talking about where I thought this thing only has two megs of RAM on it, but to go up to the like eight megabytes, there's like an entire piggyback, piggyback RAM card, which adds a whole bunch more RAM to the board. We do not, so I hit N. For board one, how many columns contain memory chips? Well, all eight columns have memory chips. This is actually kind of cool because I have a feeling it's gonna actually tell us exactly which chip is bad. Very cool. Just confirming that's where the chips are installed. You can run the memory test from one to 100 times. We'll run it one time. Now, the problem is I, I'm booted up and high mem sys is running, which might cause a problem, but maybe not. Okay, it looks like it went from column one to column two and there column three. So I guess it's gonna go through the test and then tell us the memory is good. And this is actually a great utility. So I have to recommend these above board pluses from Intel, just because they're easy to configure with that EEPROM and no dip switches near that junk. And then of course, um, this confidence test is a pretty nice little utility. For this card, we're gonna have to install some memory. So I have two megs of RAM right here. This card does require two SIMs at a time. And that's because this is a 16-bit memory card. Therefore, you gotta put two of these 8-bit SIMs in at once. There are some markings on here that look like DM1 through DM8. So I'll start over here on the DM1 slots. Now these are the plastic, terrible plastic ones. That went in pretty easily. So there we go, two megs are installed. I have no idea how this is configured. Let's pop that in. Now, one thing that is pretty cool, and I suppose, you know what? We could have actually run that utility without this RAM installed, and maybe that would have made this setup process easier. Like it wouldn't try to conflict with what's on the motherboard. Okay, so we have a memory size error. That's completely expected. So we just have to exit out and go back in. We're back in the set board utility. Let's hope that this does work. Let's let this uh, find the card, hopefully. Oh yeah, there it is, sweet. Obviously it's showing the serial number of the card. And the cool thing is if you have multiple cards in there, that will help you identify which one you're configuring. So on the last card, when we had that in there, we configured it for 258 as the base IO. Obviously, if you're gonna use multiple of these at once, you wanna change the base IO so they're not conflicting. And it looks like you can have up to eight of these cards in one system at once. Take a look at the current settings for this card. It is currently configured to add memory starting at the seventh megabyte all the way through 11 and a half megs. Well, this is gonna be exactly the same as the last one. We only have two megs of RAM total on here. So we'll do the same thing. We're gonna say it's a 12 megahertz system. The RAM is very fast on here. And we're gonna set it up as shown. This is so much easier than fiddling with a bunch of jumpers, I have to say. And those older cards with all those jumpers and the AST cards, such a pain. There we go. Oh, you know what? Um, let's save the settings. I wanna hear that ticking. So maybe this card is somehow faster. 
Nope, <laughs> not faster. <laughs> that is pretty awesome. So here's a slight curiosity. The extended memory is only showing up as 2,816K, not the full four megabytes. How could that be? I don't really understand that. Let's reboot. If we turn this back on, how high does the number count? Three, four, five, six. Is that what it counted up to on the other card? Well, luckily both cards are configured, so all we gotta do is just pop the other one in <laughs> and we should see exactly if there's any kind of difference. Yeah, it did go higher. What? I was going through the setup process again. So no conventional memory. We're starting at two megabytes and we're going up to 4.0 megabytes and view current settings. This is exactly how it's set right now but total extended memory is only 2816. It's almost like part of this RAM's not working. Let's exit out of this. Okay, so I'm gonna try the confidence test. It's the only thing I can really think to do. That's asking if we have the piggyback module installed. I'm gonna say no, because we only have two megs of RAM here and that's the same as the other card without the module. But I'm gonna say we have all eight rows of chips installed and let's hit Y and let this test and see what happens. If you're thinking about the difference between this card here, which has eight SIM slots, and this card here, which has eight columns of chips, this is kind of the equivalent of installing 256K SIMs. So that's one megabyte, and if I had four more, then we'd have two megs of RAM, exactly like if this card was fully populated with eight 256K SIMs. The difference is, I don't think this board here supports one meg chips, but the difference is that this obviously does, because I only have those two SIMs in there, and it's seen two-ish megabytes of memory. If anyone can dig up the documentation for that, okay, and it says the above board plus is operating correctly. If you change the switches, run the set board, or add memory to this board, you should run the test again. So I'm definitely confused as why the RAM test for two megs of RAM worked, and yet, it doesn't seem to be adding two megabytes of extended memory to this system. Well, I think for now, I'm not gonna do any further testing on this board. It's a bit of a curiosity as why it's not adding a full two megabytes of RAM, but I would imagine if I populate this with eight megs, we'll get most of the eight megabytes of RAM. And obviously I could actually put both of these in a system together and this would add another two megabytes, but I'm pretty sure I have another board that's not the same as this Intel one, but something kind of similar that supports up to eight megs of RAM. And this board plus that other board in my 5170 over there would max out the conventional RAM to 640K and then add almost 15 megabytes of RAM, which would be far more than that computer would ever actually need. But it's just kind of fun that it's possible anyways. All right, switching platforms. We have the C64 here. Let's plug in the cognitive learning cartridge first. And I'm gonna plug in this user port cartridge. I'm gonna, the reason why I have the lid off is the potentiometer here is probably for like volume control. And just so I can access that, because if there is any sound out of this thing, we do want to hear that, right? And I've gone ahead and I plugged the audio output of the speech cartridge into my speakers along with the uh, video or the SID output as well. So we'll hear if there's any sound on this cartridge. I don't know which joystick port to put this in, but I, I put this into the forwardmost joystick port just because it makes most sense with the way this cable routes. Okay, I'm gonna turn this on. This might be the first time that anyone has ever seen this cartridge running on real hardware on YouTube. Let's turn this on. Okay, there's a bit of a hum out of the uh, speech cartridge. All right, 1987, ESAM Learning, designed by Jerry Campbell and C. Joe Ellis. Okay. Whoa. The moving box shows how fast this program will respond. The red bar is a speed change. Change speed, press the switch for next choice. When speed is correct, press switch for this choice. Unfortunately, the little box here doesn't seem to do anything. Now, I should check to see if that battery I put in here is actually alive and not dead. Oh, you know what, though, before I do that, let's try the other port. Oh, they worked! <laughs> Look at this! Okay. It said something, and honestly, I could not understand it. Okay, so that left button. Go down. Go down. Menu. Menu. <laughs> wow. All right, let me turn the speakers up a bit just so you have a better chance of hearing it. 
needs. So the button on the right moves that selector box to the right, and this one here is the selection button. It goes into the joystick port closest to the power connector on the C64 here, and absolutely there is speech coming out of this thing. So if I hit this to select, go down, go down. Want. want, please. Yeah, please. This is. <laughs> I know very little about this type of stuff, like software made for special needs people. But as far as I'm aware, this type of an interface is something that is still used today, but I think it's done on like an iPad. And it allows people who aren't able to speak and write, for instance, to have the ability to communicate. And the reason why that selection box moves really slowly, I think, is because they may be impaired and not be able to push buttons quickly or whatever. So I think if they're like, oh, please. So we hit please. Please. Okay, and then they can select the Go next, down. they can select the next word. Want. Please. Thank you. Thank you, and then more, for instance. More. More. Okay, so. Go down. Says please more. Now if we select go down. Menu. Now we're on the bottom there on the menu. And I hit the button, yes, yes no. No. Help. Erase. I assume this is gonna go to clear, clear words. and speak. Speak words, please, more. You can build like a sentence with this tool using those pictures, and then you can hit, you know, slowly get down to the bottom there, and then hit speak. Uh, let's power cycle this, see if we can speed up the, the menu a little bit. This doesn't make for exciting content on, on YouTube. Well, what is interesting is obviously change speed. Change speed. Okay. Medium slow. Medium slow. Medium. Medium fast. Medium fast. Fast. Okay, this is the fastest speed we got. Okay, so we select that. So um, I think I was saying this doesn't make scintillating content, but we have to remember this was 19. 1987 technology. Oh, cool. Okay, so it was a lot faster now. Body. Food. Clothes. Clothes. Things. Things. Animals. Animals. Colors. Colors. Numbers. Numbers. Letters. Letters. Change speed. Change speed. Change voice. Change voice. Let's try that one. Voice off. Oh, voice off, okay. Speak once. Speak once. Speak twice. Speak twice. Speak everything. Speak everything, okay. So I gotta admit, this is pretty cool for like 1987 technology and using something as inexpensive as a Commodore 64. I don't know how much this kit cost. An interesting thing is I've dumped the ROMs for this, so I'll, I'll upload those to archive.org. What does appear to be the case though, is like the 64's keyboard doesn't actually work. And I don't know with this, uh, let's plug in a normal controller. So as I am curious if you could just use a normal joystick for people who wanna test this stuff. Okay, so pushing right actually selected the word. Go up. Okay, and pushing left is like the Menu. button to select different things. All right, cool. So you don't need to actually use this box here. You could just use a normal controller if you wanna test this out yourself using these ROMs. When I look at this thing, my guess is that these extra ports here are maybe for two external buttons. Like say you could have two really large buttons because these small ones might be difficult targets to reach. And then maybe this is also for enabling like a larger board and maybe has a grid of buttons on it or something like that. Let's pop this out and let's check out this other cartridge, the switch training. And my assumption is it's just to help people understand how to use this switch box here. So switch training, similar thing written by Jerry Campbell. Enter the number of switches you'll be using for this exercise, one or two. Now enter number two. The dog is flashing at the rate of the speed indicated by the red bar. This is the speed at which all program movement takes place. To address the speed, press the Commodore key. When the speed is correct, press return to go on. Okay, return. We're gonna do alien. All right, so indeed. 
pushing the switches equivalent, if I switch back to the little box here, pushing the different buttons here. Um, wow, it's like a little game actually. So that that's kind of fun actually. Um, it was basically moving the little alien around and then the button selected it. That's really fun. Let's try this one. Okay, that's incorrect. So I guess we're supposed to move all the way to the red box and then hit select. <laughs> all right, all right, that's cool. So there we have it, the ESAM Cognitive Learning System for 1987 for the Commodore 64. I'm assuming the first time ever shown on YouTube, at least complete with the speech module and the switch module here. I know very little about these types of systems, especially more contemporary versions today. Was this ahead of its time in 1987 or was this just following a bunch of other more expensive solutions that were already out there? I'm definitely curious to hear your thoughts. And if you have experience with loved ones who use systems like this, I would love to hear more about that as well. So I think with that, that is gonna be it for this video. It's gonna be super long. I apologize about that. If you enjoyed this type of format, definitely let me know. As I mentioned, there's two other boxes down here that I haven't even gone through yet, not to mention another five upstairs. I think if I did all of them, it would probably burn people out on these long test and try type videos, but maybe people find it interesting for me to look through treasures and stuff like that. I do know some of the boxes upstairs have more PC parts, like it's a banker's box that's just all PC parts, motherboards and cards and stuff like that. This one was a little bit more of a hodgepodge, which kind of made it interesting actually, just sort of a, a random assortment of stuff. And if you know anything about those other things that I didn't show here in this testing phase, definitely let me know as well. And I think that's gonna be that. So huge thanks to my patrons. Thanks for watching, subscribe, thumbs up, all the usual stuff, comment down below. And I guess that's gonna be that. So stay healthy, stay safe. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.